Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing high-density lipoproteins and the reverse cholesterol transport pathway. Okay, so we're still discussing the structure of high-density lipoproteins, and we're discussing the structure of a phospholipid monolayer. Okay, and for this, we're looking at examples of phospholipids. So we've seen a major category of phospholipids, which are the phosphoglycerolipids, and the prototypical example of a phosphoglycerolipid will be phosphatidylcholine, and this is going to be a major component of the phospholipid monolayer of HDL molecule and indeed of all lipoprotein molecules. Okay, however, there is another large family of phospholipid molecules, and these are the sphingomyelins. Now, the sphingomyelins are a subset of a larger family of lipids, which are not all phospholipids, okay, which is the sphingolipids. So this is the symbol from maths, meaning is a subset of, okay, uh, the sphingolipids. Okay, so not all sphingolipids are phospholipids. The sphingolipids which are phospholipids are the sphingomyelins. Okay, so we want to know what is a sphingolipid, more specifically what is a sphingomyelin. And in order to answer that question, we need to know what something called a ceramide is. And in order to answer the question of what a ceramide is, we need to know about the molecule sphingosine. Okay, so, sphingosine is the old biochemist's name for a molecule that is now more correctly called 2-amino-4-octadecene-1-3-diol. Okay, and although this is a total mouthful, it's actually not that complicated. It's telling you exactly how to build this molecule, basically. So let's go through this step by step and see if we can deduce the structure from this name. So the octadecene tells us that we're dealing with an 18-carbon molecule where we've got a double bond at one point. Now, where is this double bond? Well, this tells us that it's off the fourth carbon, okay? Then, this tells us we've just got two alcohol groups coming off this 18-carbon structure, and they come off the first and the third carbons of the um, structure. Okay, then this shows us that we've got an amino group coming off the structure, and it comes off the second carbon. So in actual fact, the only interesting carbons in this entire 18-carbon molecule are the first carbon, which has an alcohol group coming off it, the second carbon, which has an amino group coming off it, the third carbon, which has an alcohol group coming off it, and the fourth and fifth carbons, which have this double bond between them. Okay, the other 13 are just completely boring. They're completely saturated, so we'll only draw the first uh, five then. Okay, so here are the first five carbons. These are the ones which will actually have an interesting structure, basically. Okay, and then the rest of the um, carbons are just completely saturated. So we've got a methylene group here. And now that will be repeated 12 times, because remember, we've still got 13 carbons to go through. Now, 12 of them are going to be in methylene groups, and then the final one will be on a methyl group right at the end. Okay, right. So that gives us the other 13 carbons of the sphingosine molecule. Now let's look at the interesting ones. So between the fourth and the fifth carbons, we have a double bond there. Okay, and coming off each of these carbons, you'll then also have a hydrogen atom. Okay, like so. And uh, now let's deal with the first, the second, and the third carbons. So off the third carbon, we know we've got an alcohol group and also a hydrogen. Off the second carbon, we know we've got an amino group and then also a hydrogen. And off the first carbon, we know we've got an alcohol group and then two hydrogens. Okay, like so. And that is the structure of a sphingosine molecule. Now, Notice that the first three carbons have important groups coming off. Alcohol groups, amino groups, and another alcohol group here. Okay, the rest of this molecule is then just extremely hydrophobic. These are polar, and these are just, this is just a hydrophobic tail, basically. Okay, so 
what we're actually going to see is that these free carbons are going to function analogously to the free carbons of a glycerol molecule. And then it's as though we've already got a long hydrophobic tail dangling off this, basically. Okay, right. So, this is sphingosine. What we're now going to do is use sphingosine to build a type of molecule known as a ceramide. Okay, so we now want to ask, what is a ceramide then? So basically, to turn sphingosine into a ceramide, what you need to do is take a long-chain carboxylic acid. Okay, so here's the carboxylic acid group. And then we've got this long hydrophobic tail coming off this carboxylic acid carbon. And then you attach this onto the amino group of the sphingosine molecule that comes off the second carbon. So you're going to attach it onto this amino group here. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the alcohol group off the long chain carboxylic acid. You're going to take the hydrogen off the amino group. You're going to bind, bind the amino group a nitrogen atom to the carbon of the carboxylic acid group and this sort of a link is then called an amide link and you're going to bind the alcohol group that's come off the carboxylic acid group to the hydrogen that's come off the amino group to make water okay and then what you'll have is this long chain carboxylic acid group dangling off the amino group of the sphingosine molecule and that structure that you've then got is called a ceramide and the reason it's called that is it has this amide here which uh, denotes the amide link that you have attaching the sphingosine molecule to this long chain carboxylic acid okay right so we will now abbreviate the ceramide like so Okay, so I'll draw a long molecule like so to indicate the sphingosine. So this now represents the sphingosine, okay? This is the long hydrophobic tail of the sphingosine molecule. And then attached off the sphingosine molecule, we have a long chain carboxylic acid, okay? And I'll color this in in orange. Okay, and this then now is called a ceramide, so this is going to be our cartoon of a ceramide. Now, there is not just one ceramide molecule because there is not just one long chain carboxylic acid that we can attach to this amino group here via that amide link. So because there are many long chain carboxylic acids that you can actually attach in there, it means that there are many different ceramides that you can actually create. Okay, right. So, that's a ceramide. Now what we're going to do is go from a ceramide to a sphingolipid, and then we'll see more specifically what a sphingomyelin is. Okay, so, basically to turn a ceramide into this structure called a sphingolipid, what you're going to do is you're going to attach on a group onto the alcohol group that comes off the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule within the ceramide molecule. Okay, so this first carbon here has an alcohol group coming off it. You are going to attach on uh, a functional group onto that alcohol group uh, when it's within a ceramide molecule and that creates you what's known as a sphingolipid. Okay, so let's draw a cartoon of this. Okay, so we have our sphingosine molecule here. We then have our long chain carboxylic acid, which is dangling off our sphingosine molecule via this amide link between the long chain carboxylic acid and the sphingosine molecule. Okay, and now attached onto the alcohol group of the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule, you have an additional group, basically. And this additional group can vary hugely in its nature. Okay, and this is what a sphingolipid is. Okay, so now let's discuss a subset of the sphingolipids, which are the sphingomyelins. So let's discuss what group or what kind of group sphingomyelins have in this turquoise position here. So basically sphingomyelins attach a phosphate group onto that alcohol group that comes off the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule. So if I draw a picture here, here's the sphingosine molecule. Then dangling off it we have the long chain carboxylic acid. So in orange here's the long chain carboxylic acid. And here is the sphingosine molecule here. 
and then of the alcohol group on the first carbon, we then have a phosphate group, like so. So this is a phosphate group. And then that phosphate group is going to be linked onto this alcohol group via a phosphoester link. Okay, that will mean that just like in the case of the phosphoglycerolipids, uh, when we had that um, phosphatidic acid molecule, then the phosphate group had a spare alcohol group on the other side after forming a single phosphoester link. What can happen is it can form another phosphoester link to another alcohol group, basically. And then you can attach another group on there. Now, these are the sphingomyelins. So in a sphingomyelin, what you have is a phosphate group attached to the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule's alcohol group. And then off that, you will then have another group attached on. Okay, And for instance, this blue molecule here could be choline again. In fact, it often is choline, but there are other examples. Okay, right. So this is the structure of a sphingomyelin molecule. So it's a huge subset of molecules. Firstly, because there is a huge amount of variation of which long-chain carboxylic acid you have attached here. And secondly, because this blue group isn't set in stone, but an example of a group that you can put there is a choline molecule. So the thing which distinguishes sphingomyelins within the sphingolipids is that the first thing that they have attached to the alcohol alcohol group that comes off the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule is a phosphate group, and that's attached via a phosphoester link. Okay, right. So, these are the other types of phospholipids because, remember what the criteria to be a phospholipid were, you need to have a phosphate group, chick, uh, and then you need to have a long chain carboxylic acid, and we can tick that one off as well. Okay, so, um, Basically, people often now denote phospholipids through this cartoon here, okay? And I want to explain why. So they often denote phospholipids like so. So these two lines here, which I'm now going to colour in in orange, these are called the hydrophobic tails, okay? Now, let's see how this relates to the sphingomyelins and the uh, phosphoglycerolipids. Okay, so in the case of the sphingomyelins, you do actually have two hydrophobic tails. You have this long chain carboxylic acid here, which has a very long hydrophobic tail, and you also have the long hydrophobic tail of the sphingosine molecule. So, indeed, sphingomyelins do have two long hydrophobic tails, just like this cartoon says. Okay. In addition, if we go back to phosphoglycerolipids, they definitely have two long um, hydrophobic tails here in the form of these two long chain carboxylic acids, which are esterified to the alcohol groups of the first and second carbons of the glycerol molecule. Okay, right. So that's that portion. And then this other portion here. This is called the polar head of the phospholipid. So the portion that I'm now colouring in red, uh, this is referred to as the polar head. Now, the hydrophobic tails, as their name uh, suggests, are extremely hydrophobic, so they're extremely neutral. They don't have a very uh, uneven distribution of charge. They have a very even distribution of charge, and they don't interact well, therefore, with water molecules. Meanwhile, uh, the polar head is going to interact with water. Well, now, in the case of the sphingomyelins, the polar head is going to be this portion here, where you have the phosphate group and then this additional group attached on. Now, the phosphate group, if you remember, let me draw the phosphate group out as it would be within this sphingomyelin. Okay? It has these two oxygens coming off it, which will be involved in phosphoester links now. Okay, but it also has this oxygen, which has a single bond to the phosphorus atom, and also has acquired an electron via ionic means. So this is negatively charged here, basically. In addition, if you remember choline, choline had a positive charge here, so it was also charged. 
Okay, so these heads are often charged, basically, is the message here. And that's why they interact well with water, because water is polar. Okay, it's a lesser version of charge. These have got full charges, not just partial charges. These are full charges, so they're going to interact very nicely with water molecules. Okay, if we turn our attention back to the phospholipid, well, it's the same story here. We have a phosphate group, which will have this negative charge here. And then we've also got this group off the phosphate group, which could be positively charged, like the choline, so it could also have a charge. Or at least some interesting functional groups that would be able to interact with water uh, well, because they've got uh, polar bonds. Okay, right. So that's what is meant by the polar head of a phospholipid, the portion uh, which is either charged or has interesting groups in it which will be able to interact with water well, basically. Okay, so that's the cartoon people generally draw for a phospholipid. So, going back to our picture of a HDL molecule then. Okay, so if we draw this here. Remember, an HDL particle is this sphere of lipids. Okay, and the outer surface of the HDL particles are made up of this phospholipid monolayer. Okay, so you have phospholipid after phospholipid after phospholipid. And they have their polar heads facing out towards the outer world. And they have their hydrophobic uh, tails facing into the middle. Now, I should just say, what are the purpose of lipoproteins? Okay, well basically the purpose of lipoproteins, of which HDL is an example, is to carry lipid molecules around the blood. Okay, the problem with transportation of lipid molecules around the blood is that you can't just stick them into the blood and expect them to go with it. Okay, because as we've discussed, they don't dissolve well at all in water. So how do you actually transport lipids around the blood? Well, you package them up into these things called lipoproteins, okay, of which HDL is an example. And the way that lipoproteins get round the problem of the molecules being extremely hydrophobic is that they have this monolayer of phospholipids, which all have these polar heads, okay, which will face out towards the water of the blood and will interact well with the water of the blood. And then the hydrophobic tails all face into the core here, which is the hydrophobic core of the lipoprotein. And there they will interact with uh, the really hydrophobic lipids that are going to be stored in there. Okay, now, embedded into the phospholipid monolayer of HDL particles, you also have proteins. So remember, this is a lipoprotein, a high-density lipoprotein. Okay, uh, so you basically need to have not just lipids, you also need to have protein. Okay, and the protein is going to be embedded within the phospholipid monolayer. Okay, so the main protein which you have within uh, high-density lipoprotein particles is a protein called apolipoprotein A1. Okay, whoops, apolipoprotein, and then A1. And for short, apolipoprotein A1 is often abbreviated APO and then capital A1. Now, why are they called apolipoproteins? And in fact, all of the proteins that you have embedded into this phospholipid by that, sorry, phospholipid monolayer are called apolipoproteins. The reason they're called that is that uh, they refer to the protein component of the lipoprotein when it doesn't have the lipids within it. Okay, so it means the lipoprotein without the lipids, which is just the protein portion. So this refers to the protein on its own, basically, and that's why it's called apolipoprotein. So this is apolipoprotein A1, and it's the major apolipoprotein which you have within the phospholipid monolayer of HDL particles. Now, they don't necessarily just have a single apolipoprotein A1. They will have multiple of them. So let's put another apolipoprotein A1 down here. Now, there are other apolipoproteins that 
high density lipoprotein particles can also have within their phospholipid monolayer, and I'd like to discuss these now. So basically, there is a vast uh, family of apolipoproteins. Okay, so let me discuss the entire family because we might as well, because most of them can actually be in HDL particles. Okay, so we would only be emitting a few members by just discussing the ones which can be found in HDL, so we might as well discuss the full family for completion. So, basically, the apolipoproteins then are divided into five families. There is the apolipoprotein A family, and within this family there is apolipoprotein A1, which is the main one that you find within high-density lipoproteins. There is also apolipoprotein A2, and then finally apolipoprotein A4. Okay, so those are the apolipoprotein A's, and all of them can be found within HDL particles. So apolipoprotein A2 and apolipoprotein A4 are more rare to find within uh, HDL particles, but they can be found. Okay, then we have the apolipoprotein B family, and in this family we have apolipoprotein B48 apolipoprotein B100, and then that's it. Now, these two are not found in high-density lipoprotein particles. Apolipoprotein B100 is the one that you find within low-density lipoprotein particles, LDL, and apolipoprotein B48 you find within very low-density lipoproteins, which we're not going to discuss at all in this video. We're going to discuss LDL later, but we won't discuss VLDL at any point. Okay, right. So those two aren't found within HDL particles. Then we've got the apolipoprotein C family. And in the apolipoprotein C family, we have apolipoprotein C1. We also have apolipoprotein C2. And then finally, apolipoprotein C3. And all three of these can be found within HDL particles, although they're quite rare to find within HDL particles. Okay, then finally, we have the apolipoprotein D, which is the only member of the apolipoprotein D family, and then also apolipoprotein E, which is the only member of the apolipoprotein E family. And both of these two can be found within high-density lipoproteins as well. Okay, so the only two that can't be found in HDL particles are apolipoprotein B48 and apolipoprotein B100. Okay, so let's draw a few other uh, apolipoproteins in here. Okay, so in green here, this is an apolipoprotein. Should we say it's apolipoprotein E, maybe? Okay, so this can be apolipoprotein E. Okay, and then I'll make up the rest of this gap with some more uh, phospholipids. Okay, and I should mention that the main phospholipid that you have within the phospholipid monolayer of high-density lipoproteins, and in fact all lipoproteins, is lecithin, okay, so phosphatidylcholine. So I didn't just talk about that one by accident. That's the main one which you find within the phospholipid monolayer of these high-density lipoproteins. Now, another little piece of information I want to give you is the diameter of a general uh, high-density lipoprotein. Okay, so they're quite small. They generally have a diameter between 8 and 11 nanometers. Okay, so that's small compared to some of the other lipoproteins, such as chylomicrons. Okay, right. So we've now discussed this um, hydro well, we discussed this phospholipid monolayer, which has the polar heads facing out towards the water, and then these hydrophobic tails facing in towards the center, which is where we're going to store the very um, hydrophobic lipid molecules that we want to transport around the blood. Now, what are these extremely hydrophobic lipid molecules that we want to transport around the blood? Well, they're cholesterol esters. Okay, so we now need to turn our attention to discussing cholesterol and cholesterol esters. Okay, right. Uh, so, let's start with cholesterol then. Okay, so cholesterol is a steroid. Okay, 
uh, well, more specifically, it's a sterol, but all sterols are steroids, so it is a steroid fundamentally. So, let's start off with what the structure of steroid is. Now, this surprises people when they see it for the first time, because people expect steroids to be defined on the basis of their biological function. Okay, uh, from pop culture, people expect them to be just molecules which have an extremely potent action within the body. However, steroids are actually defined by chemists. They're defined on the basis of their chemical structure. Okay, and basically, in order to be considered a steroid, what you have to have within your structure is um, a four uh, carbon ring structure. Okay, or rather four carbon rings stuck together. Um, okay, right. So when we're discussing steroid structures, we always draw skeletal formulae, okay, rather than molecular formulae, because if you draw skeletal formulae, you get something that looks ridiculously simple, whereas if you draw molecular formulae, you get something that looks horrendous, okay? So in skeletal formulae, remember, we don't show carbon atoms. They're implicitly shown by corners and by the meeting points of bonds, and we also don't show hydrogen atoms coming off carbon atoms. So when you have missing bonds coming off hydrogen atoms, it's assumed that you understand that those are two hydrogen atoms. Okay, so if we use those rules, the steroid structure actually becomes extremely simple. You have these three six-membered rings like so, and then you have a five-membered ring right on the end here. Okay, and these rings are labelled ring A, ring B, ring C, ring D, and that's it, okay? Now, it looks deceptively simple, okay? It looks too simple. It looks as though we must have done something wrong, and the reason it looks so simple is because all it is is carbon atoms linked to carbon atoms, which you don't show, and then hydrogen atoms linked off carbon atoms, which is why the structure has ended up so uh, ridiculously simple, basically. Okay, so for instance, if you look at this carbon here, this has got two bonds to other carbon atoms, but then the other two bonds will be to hydrogen atoms, which have then not been shown on this skeletal formula. Okay, so one more core sort of steroid terminology that I want to introduce you to is the naming system for all the carbons within this steroid structure, because that will help us when I'm... Um, trying to tell you um, where we're going to add bits onto, basically. Okay, so you start with this carbon up here in the A ring. You call that carbon number one. Then you go round. This is carbon number two. This is carbon number three. This is carbon number four. This is carbon number five. This is carbon number six. This is carbon number seven. This is carbon number eight. This is carbon number nine. This is carbon number ten. Then we jump over to here. This is carbon number 11, carbon number 12, carbon number 13, carbon number 14, carbon number 15, carbon number 16, and carbon number 17. So that's how you label up the carbons within a steroid ring, and you never ever drop that naming system, no matter what you're dealing with. If it's got this ring system in, you always use that naming system. Okay, right. So, how do we then turn a steroid into a sterol? Okay, well, basically, you stick an alcohol group off this molecule, and it comes off carbon-free down here. Okay, so you're going to put an alcohol group off carbon-free of the steroid structure, and that creates you a sterol. Now, let's show now, specifically, cholesterol, which is a sterol. So I'm going to draw a fresh picture for this. So we'll revise now our sterile structure. So here is ring A with an alcohol group coming off carbon-free. Then we've got ring B, which is another six-membered carbon ring. Then we've got ring C, the third uh, six-membered carbon ring. And then ring D, which is the five-membered carbon ring on the end. Okay, now, to turn this into cholesterol, what you do is you turn this bond here between carbon-5 and carbon-6 into a double bond. Then, of carbon-10 here, you put a methyl group. 
of carbon 13 up here you put a methyl group and then of carbon 17 you're going to attach a seven membered side chain so let me show this so basically you're going to have one two three four five six seven carbons coming off like that and off the sixth carbon of this side chain you're also going to have a methyl group coming off Okay, so this is the side chain that you're going to add. So it's actually an eight carbon side chain, but the main bulk of it is seven carbons with a methyl group coming off. Okay, so this then is the structure of cholesterol. Now, HDL particles do have cholesterol within them. Okay, they do have free cholesterol molecules like so within them. Now, let's discuss where these cholesterol molecules are actually going to be found within the HDL structure. And for this, we need to discuss the structure of cholesterol in a bit more detail. So, this steroid ring structure, along with these side chains that you've got sticking off, those are extremely hydrophobic. Okay, we've got carbon atoms linked to carbon atoms with hydrogens then linked off them. Okay, so we know that that sort of a structure is extremely hydrophobic and therefore is not going to interact well with water. However, cholesterol has one little polar group right down here, which is this alcohol group that comes off the third carbon of the steroid ring structure and turns it into a sterol. Okay, this is extremely polar because oxygen has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen and also than carbon, so it will be pulling the electrons towards it and it will have a partial negative charge, whilst this hydrogen and this carbon will have partial positive charges. This, therefore, can actually interact with water. So, what you actually do is if we get our picture of HDL back again, you have cholesterol molecules stored within the phospholipid monolayer. Okay, so let me show one of these. So I'll colour it in in some very distinctive colour. Turquoise, I think. Okay, so there, that molecule that's now coloured in turquoise, this is basically meant to represent a cholesterol molecule that's sitting within that phospholipid monolayer. And basically, it will have the alcohol group that comes off it facing out into the watery environment, basically, along with the polar heads of the phospholipids, and then it will have its hydrophobic steroid ring structure uh, facing into the hydrophobic core, basically. So you'll have free cholesterol molecules stored within the phospholipid monolayer of HDL particles. So let me show a few of these here. You'll have multiple of these. Okay, there we go. So a few free cholesterol molecules dotted around. Now then, the hydrophobic core of HDL molecules is then going to be devoted to cholesterol esters. Okay, so we now want to discuss uh, the structure of a cholesterol ester. Okay, so to turn a cholesterol molecule into a cholesterol ester, what you need to do is you bring a long chain carboxylic acid. Okay, like so. So here is the carboxylic acid group, here is the long hydrophobic tail. And what you're going to do is you're going to link this long chain carboxylic acid onto that alcohol group. Okay, so you will take the alcohol group off the carboxylic acid group, you'll take the hydrogen off the alcohol group, you'll combine those two things together to make water, and you'll then link the oxygen in the alcohol group onto the carbon of the carboxylic acid group, and you've then got this long hydrophobic tail dangling off the cholesterol molecule, and that produces you a cholesterol ester. Okay, now, um, basically, this means that these cholesterol molecules, which have these long hydrophobic carboxylic acids sticking off them, can no longer be stored in the phospholipid monolayer. Because remember, we were going to have the alcohol group pointing out so that it could interact with the water molecules. Now, if it's pointing out, it will have this long hydrophobic uh, tail sticking off into the outside. So if I get my picture back, if we put one of these in the phospholipid monolayer, like we put a free cholesterol molecule, it would now have a long hydrophobic tail sticking out like this. This is not what we do, because that would not 
interact at all well with water molecules. Okay, so this is not right. What instead we do is we store these cholesterol esters in the hydrophobic core of the HDL particle. So this space here will be stuffed full of cholesterol esters. Okay, and this is the main cargo that HDL particles are going to transport, basically. So CE is just short for cholesterol esters. Now, that then is my beginning discussion of uh, the structure of HDL complete. There are a few other things that we're going to have to come across, which are also in HDL particles, but they're not kind of the core things that we need to introduce uh, at the beginning. Okay, so we'll come back to this picture and modify it later. Uh, but um, what we'll begin now is a discussion of the actual reverse cholesterol transport process. Okay, and we'll begin with the actual production of these HDL particles because these HDL particles are the particles which will go into the blood and go to peripheral cells which have cholesterol overload and will extract the cholesterol from them. So where do they initially come from? Well, they're synthesized by the liver primarily, but they're also synthesized by another place as well, which is the enterocytes of the small intestine. Okay, but we'll have a break here, and in the next video we'll begin that discussion of the reverse cholesterol transport process.